Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's Let's Talk Dairy. So, as I said to you last week, um, this week I'm going to be I'm joined by Joe Kelleher. So, Joe and I were colleagues when I used to work in the Limerick unit, and as I was just saying to Joe, uh, people often say that he's, or people are saying that since he became organic specialist, that he's gone over to the other side, basically having been a conventional dairy advisor in uh, Newcastle West for many years. But Joe is very good on numbers and very good at business planning and so forth. So I was just saying to him there that anyone that said anything to me about him becoming the specialist for organics, I said to them that if anyone's going to make organics work, it'll be Joe Keller will make it work for dairy farmers because of his ability to combine good advisory skills that he has with um, with knowledge in terms of business planning and so forth as well. So he'll so he'll be able to to make it pay basically for people. So. I asked Joe to come on today because, look, there's obviously with Pippa Hackett in, in government, there's been a push towards organics uh, and there's a bit more interest in it maybe in the last number of years uh, as well. Um, and Joe is going to be in a, a good position, I suppose, to talk about it from uh, a numbers point of view. And we'll say that there's an increase in the demand for organic product as well now from the dairy side and that there's markets for it. So. Um, we're going to have a conversation today. There's no presentation associated with the, the webinar today. So um, I'll encourage you to put in questions as we go along. But Joe, I might just start by asking you, like, what kind of a demand is there for, for dairy, we'll say organic dairy? And is it a domestic um, demand or is there actually, can we or can we export some of this as well? Yeah, I suppose it's it's... It's a bit of both, really. So if we kind of look back historically, maybe at, at the organic market in Ireland, it has traditionally been the liquid milk market that has dominated it. And that has kind of formed the main processor. So you four processors in the country, the likes of Glynis, Carabon, Arivo, and the Village Dairy in Carlo, who were focused a lot on the liquid side of the market, the liquid milk. Uh, and because of that, then they want the 12 month supply, um, which to lead to an autumn calving system. Uh, but in later years, um, there's been a shift in that market really towards similar to conventional dairy uh, in that it's going more to, to the products and the commodity uh, market. So there's a big demand now for, uh, in particular, yogurt and cheese are the two uh, big areas at the moment where we're seeing the demand. So Glenisk uh, would have a grass-fed yogurt there. Um, that's very, it's a very strong seller in the German markets in particular. Um, and that's one of their main growth areas. And that, that's a, a spring that will, that suits a spring calving system. The, the other one then is the little milk company. So they convert all their milk into, into cheese. And their, their cheese then is typically sold to France, Germany, and America would be their, their main outlets. And there's huge demand for that product. Um, they, would have, they would have sold four times the quantity this year of that cheese if they had the milk to produce it. So there is, there is a, a gap in the market there. There is a, a need for extra suppliers. But even, even aside from that, like, there's other areas that I don't think we've even touched on in organics. Like, there's no processor doing organic butter, if you look at it in the country. Like, and um, we sent 35,000 tonnes of uh, conventional butter to the German market alone. Um, and uh, the demand for organic produce in Germany and France uh, alone is, is massive. Like, if you take the, the Irish organic market for food and drink, organic food and drink, is worth 190 million. The French and the German markets combined are worth 23 billion. So, or 23 million, sorry. Um, so, like, that's um, 23 billion. Yeah, sorry. Right. So, it's, it's more than 100 times uh, the size of the market that we have here domestically. So, that's, that's where the action is happening. And there's, there is a lot of incentives being put on in mainland Europe to encourage consumers to consume more organic produce. And there's huge um, increases in the, the demand for the European consumer in particular, um, and their demand in this product. So, if we can if we can tap into that market, similar to what we're doing in conventional circles, uh, there's there's this huge opportunities. And and the other one, then of course, like is is uh, that we haven't touched on either is the baby food. Like you can buy a tub of baby food in most supermarkets here in Ireland, organic baby food, um, and that's French baby powder. And for the most part, it's making that baby food. So we're we're exporting conventional baby powder to China and places like this. But we're importing organic baby powder to to in turn and to make organic baby food. So there's huge potential there uh, in the market. I think, especially in the dairy side of things, it's it's there's there's massive opportunities. 
Yeah, because that's that's interesting, Joe. Because I was kind of one of the other questions that I had for you this morning is like, is is it a bit niche? Like, so do you know that if a lot of people did so, if you if you were very successful and you achieve your target in terms of the numbers that you want to get in, does the price for organic produce suddenly drop because we know we have to cut the cloth to try to get it into the markets? But actually, that's kind of quite the opposite. So, from what you're saying there. It is and it isn't, because like if you take that we're at 2% uh, nationally of land in Ireland is under organic farming, and our target is to get to 7.5% by 2027. Um, so like that's still niche, really, in my eyes, because like, there's still 93% of the land has been farmed conventionally. So it isn't that we're trying to convert everyone in the country. We just There won't be a market there for that, and there won't be a market there for large. So 7.5% is still a niche market. We just, it just has to be a bigger niche if you know what I'm saying. And yeah. if we look at the dairy side of things, it's even smaller. Like the dairy, we're a third of 1% is what we are at the moment. The 66 organic dairy farmers out of 17 and a half thousand in the country are organic. And like in the short term, like if we could get that to 1%, that'd be huge. So like that's a that's hundred extra farmers really you're looking yeah. at. So like that's not flooding any market with organic produce, you know, a hundred extra farmers. So that, that'd be a medium term goal really that I would see that we could try to get a hundred farmers extra into organic dairy. And uh, the, the seven and a half percent like the reality is that using a lot of that is probably because of the nature of the farming systems a lot of that is going to come from sheep and beef farmers and um, so dairy possibly we may not get to seven and a half percent of dairy farmers in organic but we definitely get higher than where we are at the moment okay and then i suppose to come down to the nuts and bolts of it then the um the actual process of organic what 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 does a farmer have to to be doing in order to be classified as organic obviously we have the conversion phase and then, and then we get to fully organic. So obviously concentrating on the dairy side, given the, the name of the program, what's the, what's the move to organics for a dairy farmer and what yeah. are the implications for the conventional farmer that's currently operating as they are operating? What are they going to have to change to become organic? Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think your question is kind of right because uh, the first thing that you have to do is convert the farmer and second thing is convert the farm. Um, and to convert the farmer, like as I say, you, you, you can convert every farm in the country to organics, uh, but you can't convert every farmer. Um, so it, it's the, the mindset is the first thing. Um, if, if, you're, if you're the farmer that sees a weed, you look out the window, the kitchen window, and you see weed outside in the field in front of the house, and your first instinct is, I must get the knapsack to spray that weed. Uh, but then maybe organics isn't the right choice for you. Do you know, if you're heavily dependent on uh, chemical fertilizer at the moment, um, there's going to be huge changes for you to adapt. Um, so on the other side, if if you if you see a weed and doesn't really bother you, um, or if you're not very heavily dependent on chemical fertilizer, if you've been sowing lots of clover, uh, bits of multi-species wards, planting trees, doing things like that, you're kind of demonstrating that that you're uh, environmentally conscious and you know maybe organic is a good fit for you so it it's it's the mindset first of all that has to change um i suppose one of the big differences i've seen because like i'm on, i'm only in this gig six months now and one of the big differences i've seen from the previous role that i had in conventional dairy and uh, organic is the way you look at a field even and the way you look at your farm so like a conventional dairy farmer goes out into a field and he sees that feel the grass has gone a bit yellow or there's something a bit different the first thing he's going to do is he's going to go for the fertilizer spreader to throw something on it so you're you're judging everything by the appearance of the crop whereas in organics you're looking at the soil so you feed the soil you look after the soil and you leave that drive the crop and what what you'll see with farmers that go into organics for the first time is they're going to probably have a, a tough enough first 12 months because the farm is completely adjusted and it's used to getting fed from the top it's used to this uh chemical nitrogen and P's and K has been thrown out on it and it's used to the, the roots are sitting near the surface of the ground waiting for this uh, feed to come to it so it, it kind of gets lazy and it doesn't have to go uh, digging for its own resources whereas after a year of uh, not being fed it realizes I have to go look for this myself and the roots start to go down through the soil profile and you get increased uh, soil health you get increased soil biology um, like if you take for example an earthworm uh, we, we often overlook them like but Earthworm, if an earthworm passes soil through its system, you can actually increase the availability by phosphorus by seven times by uh, just passing soil through an earthworm. So the easiest way to increase, by 95% of the phosphorus in our soils is locked up. So we have huge amounts of phosphorus in all our soils, but 95% of it is locked up. It's not available to plants. But if we can pass it through an earthworm, we unlock a huge amount of that. So if you can get more earthworms in your soil, you can get more phosphorus in your soil. 
And some of the, the studies I've seen, like, are, and a lot of them would be anecdotal kind of things now from farmers, but like, you're talking about a trebling in the number of earthworm counts in a spade full of soil was typically what you would see in organic farms versus non-organic farms. So you're increasing that, you're, you're increasing the biology, you're creating an environment for clover to thrive. Um, and you'll find that, that growth actually rebounds strong on these farms after two or three years uh, in organics. So typically, a lot of farmers may have to drop the stocking rate low enough the first year, but they can actually climb back up again as they, they, they go on through it. Um, I kind of got off a bit on a tangent there. What was your no, okay. No, uh, but it, are there actually learnings in it? In like, Can the conventional farms, following on a small bit from what we covered at the dairy conference maybe yesterday in relation to the clover, of which there was a lovely photo of behind you there, like um, Ger Pardy said yesterday like that he had clover on his farm with a good number of years, but hadn't cut back the nitrogen. He went about putting in clover because he was looking for the extra solids that can and more park were seeing from those trials. And, and uh, last year, then Jim Miles, who's his local advisor, said to him about cutting back a bit in the nitrogen on those high clover swords that he did have. And he cut back and he found that his clover content actually went up as well as reducing his, his nitrogen uh, usage. So like if you take if we were to take if a conventional farmers were even to take a leaf out of the organic farm book, they could probably like they could they could learn a bit, could they? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, like the clover, the clover is huge on organic farms and has been for the last 30, 40 years. You know, we've the, the organic farms have been uh, kind of growing clover when maybe it wasn't popular anywhere else. It's the driver behind our system. Like it's the only place they can get nitrogen. If you look at it very simply, like 78, 79% of the air we breathe in is nitrogen. And if someone told you there was a plant that could magically take that uh, nitrogen out of the atmosphere and turn it into available nitrogen for the plant, you'd say it wouldn't be great. And there is. Um, so like, uh, like we have a video that we show of a bee farmer above in, uh, in Sligo. He's a Danny Kilcullen, his name, like, and he's, he's one comment on it. And he's kind of like, he says, I can't figure out why people are buying all this chemical nitrogen. He said, well, you can get it from the air for free. And, uh, and it's, it, 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 it's true to a certain extent. Like, like if you take James Humphrey's trials below in Salahid, like James is growing 13 pounds five ton of dry matter um on clover only swords zero nitrogen yeah. um not clover only sorry clover grass but 50 percent clover, clover yeah, zero in. Yeah. um but with zero in like and he's carrying a stocking rate of 2.35 on that which is above what we are, we're loading organic because you can only stock the max you can stock in organic is two you can't go into derogation in, in organics um so like it, it there's huge but i suppose that maybe the other one that's kind of forgotten an awful lot I think and is the red clover like like all well, most organic farmers will have red clover in their system like and they're getting um, anywhere between 13 and 16 ton of dry matter off these red clover swords uh, with zero nitrogen again um, so like that that to me has huge potential for the, the conventional dairy farmers um, like I, I know traditionally it's seen that you put it on the outside block that's down the road and you put it three or four times but I, I think there's a road for it nearer to home than that I think we can be putting it on the milking block or anywhere we intend cutting silage um, and put it into a bit of a rotation it will die out after four or five years um, yeah. and you will have to well you may have to replenish it because it's typically sown with a, a rye grass and a white clover mix so if the red clover dies out you should be left with a, a good mix of uh, of rye grass and white clover sward that you just so if it's in the grazing block you convert that back into a grazing field if you have enough land in the grazing block that you typically do take a bit of silage off the grazing block it fits in there too in my eyes um so i, I think great clover is probably one of the the hidden secrets maybe that the the organic farmers have that, that conventional farmers are slowly kind of getting to grips i know i know a few now around here locally in limerick that would be trying it in the last the last few years and i think i think there's going to be more jumping on that ship yeah, and indeed the two guys that were on the conference with us yesterday are beginning to go that direction as well for outside blocks as well. So there's two questions here, Joe, um, from the same person. The first one is, how do you go about getting more earthworms? How do you go about getting more earthworms? Yeah. Well, you can buy them in. Uh, so, uh, well, maybe you can, but I wouldn't go that route because uh, what you'll find is like everything, if you create the right environment, they will come. Um, so like chemical nitrogen and herbicides and pesticides is has been proven that it's just it's not creating the right environment it's not creating the environment that they they appreciate multi-species swords i know some people love them some people don't like them but multi-species swords are fantastic for getting earthworms into paddocks um 
there's a guy there, Kevin O'Hanlon, blown Wexford. He's an organic farmer since last year. Like Kevin has shown that he's multi-species forwards. He's got 23 acorns per spade full versus three or four in conventional paddocks. Like, um, so they're fantastic for for getting dirt worm pot population in there uh, it's just that they, they loosen up the soil so they're creating the environment uh, they're deep rooted so they're, they're they're creating the environment that the, the earthworm likes um so yeah it's just it's just going a bit lighter on the chemicals the fertilizer and the sprays and maybe doing something like multi-species is you can't do an awful lot you can't you, you can look at the biological amendments but you're going into a different league altogether if you're if you're going down that route Okay, and then the other question um, is, is it a bit of a chicken and egg situation with regard to organics because there's only a few organic processors and it's actually a question I had for you as well in terms of location of those processors and where people are for to, to become organic. Maybe is it, a, is it something that puts people off of, of looking into it because they feel that there's, someone very, there's no one close by to collect the milk. So the, the question that's come in is if there was more processing it happening locally or more 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 processors at it would it actually encourage more people to go organic it would there's no doubt in saying that it would what what the organic market ideally needs is one of the major processors to come in and take a, an interest in that infant formula market um i think there's there's scope there for 100 or 200 uh, organic farmers to be supplying a dryer somewhere in the country that would be converting that milk into organic baby powder and there's a market there for that if if one of the the bigger co-ops did take an interest in that um none of them do seem to be taking an interest at the moment i know there's a lot of them looking at it but maybe maybe one of them might make that leap but going back to the existing processors that's there like as i said there is demand there from the likes of glynisk and the little milk company at the moment little milk company have suppliers in Cork, Kerry, they've a supplier above in Cavan, they have suppliers in Wexford, they, they'll go pretty much anywhere to get the milk. They, they want spring calving herds. Um, Glynisk are pretty much covering the country as well, so they'll, they're willing. And, and, and the organic co-ops that are there work well with each other is what I would say, so they're, they'll, they'll trade off suppliers uh, with each other, you know, if there's if to, yeah, to they won't one another on the road. Exactly. Like the same amount of milk, yeah. So, so no, I wouldn't like... Um, Cork, strangely enough, Cork is actually one of the counties where there's, there's, there isn't an awful lot of organic dairy farmers, believe it or not, um, even though there's more dairy farmers in Cork than anywhere else. But there is a good bit of interest coming from the likes of West Cork in particular, and seeing a lot of my inquiries would be coming out there. But the likes of Little Milk Company uh, would have no issue going, going to the likes of West Cork to, uh, to collect milk. Um, their, their milk is processed in Mogili uh, in East Cork, so yeah. that wouldn't be a big stretch for them. Uh, yeah. But as I said, no, the, the, the processors there are, are covering the 26 counties. Okay, so Joe, getting into the mechanics of it then, we'll say converting over, and then we might move on to the financial side of it. We'll say, I know you have some figures there that you kind of maybe, uh, to, to make it all work for people, um, yeah. So we'll go through the, the conversion piece first. So the conversion piece is, as I said, the first thing is the farmer has been converted. So we've gone through that. So we're assuming he's, he's, his mind is made up. And then the next thing we need to do is convert the farm. So um, I suppose before I go into maybe stock and rate and things like that, just the, the practical things of housing is 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 one of the big items uh housing is actually harder to get right in a beef setting than it is in a dairy setting because if you have good sized cubicle beds uh you will be allowed to continue with them in an organic system the rule in organics is that 50 percent of the floor area has to be a solid floor area but your cubicle bed can't count for part of that 50 percent now it's meant to be an eight foot by four foot cubicle but if you're near enough to that most of the certification bodies will will work with you you may have to put an extra lying area in the house to to get that extra bit and sometimes it might be something like putting 70 cows into an 80 cow cubicle house or something like that to get that that cubicle has to be bedded then at all times it has to have a mat and has to be bedded uh, so typically you're looking at a sawdust and lime kind of mixture uh, untreated sawdust and lime cubicle lime mixture to, to bed that that mat so that's uh, i think that's the bit that there is a conception out there that the cows have to be straw bedded but they don't you can you can work with your existing cubicle house if 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 that's what you have um the second thing i suppose is the the veterinary side of things maybe is, is the change in that and again there's a kind of a misconception out there that we can't use any antibiotics but the reality is one of the core principles of organic farming is that the care of the animal comes pretty much at the top of the list so if an animal is sick and if an animal needs an antibiotic she gets an antibiotic 
Uh, it's what happens after that is where the change comes in. So in organics, you would typically have to double or treble the withdrawal period, depending on the product you're using. It typically ends up near enough to a two month withdrawal period for a lot of the, the common antibiotics. Um, take mastitis, for example, a cow can get two courses of antibiotics in a 12 month period. Uh, if she goes over the two courses, unfortunately, her milk cannot be called organic um, after that, that period. So she typically has to pack her bags and go if she gets more than two courses of antibiotics. Um, I suppose just on that, typically we, we, we don't see major cell count issues in organic farms again, which is something I know that would be a kind of a fear. We had a, we had a webinar last night and we had two farmers on like, and we asked them about the challenges and they both said the fear, the, the dairy farmer we had on Coleman said his fear was that would he be able to grow enough grass and the tillage farmer we had on, his fear was would the weeds going to take over? And as they both said, uh, they realized that their, their fears were unfounded after a year or two that the dairy farmer was growing plenty of grass and the, the weeds didn't take over the tillage farmer as he had expected. Um, so yeah, that's, that's that. Then maybe just going on to the stocking rate um, and, and maybe my touch on soil fertility and that when you're converting. So the stocking rate is kind of the, one of the key areas really you have to get right when you're going into organic. So the average organic dairy farmer would be stocked at one and a half livestock units per hectare. Um, and that can range from one up to two. Um, I think that even though there's only 66 organic dairy farmers out there, uh, there's a kind of perception that there's only one system of organic dairy farming, but there's, there's the, it, in my eyes, there's 66 systems out there um, because there, there's a huge variation in what's going on. So if you take, um, you have farmers there that would be once a day organic, so blind the likes of the little milk company, spring calving, um, like they, they would be feeding little or no meal. Um, there would be lit, very little inputs coming into gate full stop. There'd be no fertilizer coming into gate. There'd be no meal coming into gate. Uh, so it's very minimal what would be coming into gate. Um, their, their output will be low. They, they might be doing three, 300, 350 kilos of mix salads a cow. Um, but their costs are, are, are very, very low. Um, so it, it, it works out as being a very, very profitable system for them. You compare that then with some of the autumn calving herds who can be feeding two to three ton of concentrate, a lot of that which could more than likely would be homegrown um, and they can be doing north of 7,000 litres of cow um, of output. So you, you have huge extremes within the systems, within organic. So it's, it's a case of finding the system that suits you and sometimes the stock and rate um, kind of goes with that. So uh, the way I would like, you know, as well as I do, like the, the trials would say that a uh, kind of rye grass or old permanent pasture getting no nitrogen is going to grow five to six ton of dry matter probably somewhere in around that. Uh, and if that's what you have within your stock rate has to match that and that's going to be somewhere around one livestock unit per hectare. On the other hand, if you can go to the other extreme and you can uh, get 20, 30, 40 percent clover content into your pastures, if you have a bit of multi-species wards, you can grow somewhere between 10 and 12 tons and that'll allow you to carry two livestock units per hectare. Um, and the reality is that a lot of farmers will be somewhere in the middle. If you have red clover grown on the outside, like what's behind my back here, um, you can get 13 to 15 ton of dry matter off of that, which allows you to, to build a bulk of silage for the winter. So it allows you to carry a higher stocking rate again. Um, so stocking rate is the exact same as conventional. It's totally dependent on what you grow and the amount of, of forage that you can grow on your farm. Um, that's why you joy you would have said it there that some people will probably come back but then they can go forward once the farm kicks into gear basically in the organic regime like exactly and it's it's like you'd some you'd often get the question uh, what what should my stocking rate be like and the answer always is it depends it's kind of like the lad asking for directions how do i get to, to there and you the, the carry man says uh, where are you starting from <laughs> um so it's the same here like it's where are you starting from if if you have a lot of clover on your farm maybe you don't have to drop back you know your your farm might be ready to take off yeah. Uh, you know, you might be able to sustain a decent stocking rate day one, but if you have very little clover on your farm, you are going to have to, to, to drop back that bit. So it, it is very much dependent on where you're starting from. I just said there to start on soil fertility. Soil fertility is another one that's kind of, again, there's, a, I think, a misconception out there with organics in that it thinks that once you go into organic, you forget about soil fertility, but you don't. You, you, you just look at it differently. Uh, you have to look at getting your nutrients from different sources. So we're getting our nitrogen from the sky. Um, or phosphorus, we have a couple of options. Um, dairy sludge, a lot of the co-ops, their dairy sludge would be approved for use on organic farms. So that's, that's a great source of phosphorus on a lot of, of organic dairy farms. Um, 
we can use products like ground rock phosphate. Um, they're freely available. Uh, some of them are approved for organic, some of them aren't. You have to just check to make sure there's no chemical process in the, the manufacturing of these products. Um, they can cost at the moment seven, 700 to 750 a tonne, which sound, sounded very dear last year. Maybe it doesn't sound that dear this year. <laughs> um, you have, there's K products out there. Um, now, I suppose with the K, uh, if you are bedding your cows and straw, straw is a fantastic source of K. Mm-hmm. Um, and organic farmers would use their straw as a source of fertilizer almost. You're get, bringing K onto your farm with every bale of straw you're bringing in. So it's a great way of getting K onto your farm. Uh, and then by bedding your cattle, you're really adding value to that K product. Uh, there's also bagged K you can get. You can get products like Keserite and Calisop and things like that, um, which are sulfate of, of phosphate. Um, so Murita Botish is a... Is a He's a kind of a, a severe enough fertilizer on soil biology, um, whereas sulfate potash, potash is a much kinder uh, type of potash. Um, so yeah, look, there are sources. So you're, you're still trying to, we're not, we're not looking for index three, I suppose, is the other big difference in organic because we don't have the big off takes. Yeah. Yeah, we're not taking off 13 and 14 ton of dry matter per hectare. We're nearer to nine and 10 ton probably per hectare. So you, because you don't have the off takes, you're not stripping as much off and you shouldn't have to replace as much. So we can typically work away at an index two um, in organic. So really what you're trying to do is you're trying to get the index ones out of index one is typically what you're trying to do in terms of soil fertility. Um, and obviously this, the cattle story. Oh yeah, that's, that's, you, can, you can bring in cattle story from your conventional neighbor in organics. Um, you can bring in farm and manure from your conventional neighbor. So anything that's an outdoor system, you can bring it in in organics. What you can't bring in is you can't bring in intensive systems. So pig, pig slurry, for example, wouldn't be allowed in organics. Uh, Poultry manure, you can bring in free range poultry manure. You can't bring in confined, but you've the botulism risk there as well to, yes. to weigh up. Um, so let, there's lots of sources of getting our, our 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 nutrients, and lime, of course, is is allowed to be used. And lime is the is the one thing we have to put up because that clover, like our pH for grass is six point three, but our clover is like six point seven or thereabouts. So we have to get our pH is probably that bit higher in an organic setting than we would in a conventional setting as well. Okay, and then just, uh, I suppose, before I go to the financial uh, kind of the case study example that you have there, maybe just the um, the actual cow conversion then as well, you were saying about that there recently to me, that we'll say the, how, the process of converting the cow. So the herd of cows that we have currently now, I just, I have, my head is in the right frame of mind, I'm going to become organic. I've been talking to you about my business plan, etc. What's the situation with the conversion process for the, the actual milk that the cows are supplying? Yeah, so you take the farmer with his herd of cows outside and he decides to go organic. He can work away with the herd of cows he has. They just come into the organic system. They go through the two-year conversion period. So for the first two years, you're selling your milk to your existing supplier, conventional supplier, uh, and you that milk is not considered organic until you've completed your two-year conversion period. Um, at that stage, that milk thing can be sold to one of the organic processors after the two years that cow uh that's fine the cow's milk will can become organic but that cow can never become organic um now once three months has passed in your conversion period and that cow has um a frisian heifer calf that frisian heifer calf is an organic cow um and she she herself can be sold into the organic food chain now i suppose in theory she can but at the moment there's no market there for um organic cull cows um so they, they are sold into the conventional food chain really is, is where they end up okay and um so basically if if you decided to convert on the first of january anything born after the end of march heifer wise would be fitting into the system but the heifers that will be born in 2023 will all be organic heifers organic. In the exactly i suppose one one point there just is is but we would have a few uh kind of dry stock farmers and that that are looking at converting to dairy and and um, like buying in the stock, buying in. So really, for them, the the easiest way to do that is ideally buying your stock before you convert. Because yeah. with, with sixty six dairy farmers in the country, like your your just, your outlets to buy stock, uh, either you have to go scrounging a lot from those sixty six, or you're importing. Um, so really, you would be inclined to say, uh, kind of get the herd in first, or get buy in Frisian heifer calves, or buy in in calf heifers and then convert afterwards. Okay. And then just, I suppose, briefly, because I, I know I need to get finished up there yourself, 
Um, just kind of the, roughly the economics around it, the way you've, you've said it to me there before, we'll say obviously fertilizers going out, outputs coming down, there's mm-hmm. a bit of a balance in that, but you're still, you're still able to make it work on a business plan. Yeah, so like uh, the business plan side of it, is, it doesn't need to be too complicated, I think, when it comes to organics. Uh, so the first, like when you're working down through your Excel sheet, the first thing is the cow numbers. So you have to see where's your existing stock and rate and where you're pitching your new stock and rate. And typically I would pitch that at one and a half on the whole farm stock and rate. Um, so you have to see what what does that look like in, in your cow numbers? What does one and a half livestock uh, units? Sometimes there's a lot of surplus stock, you know, outside of the cows that you can cut them back a bit and maybe the cow numbers mightn't have to drop. So because of that, your milk sales, your litres of milk going out the gate are going to drop. Your milk per cow, I, I would rarely drop the milk per cow um, because you can still get, I, I would do my business plan on feeding the same level of meat. So instead of spending 300 euros a ton, we'll buy it for 600 euros a ton, which is the cost of organic meal. And I only do that purely, for, I wouldn't be advising anyone to do that, but I just do it purely for the, the, the sum of the business plan, just to show that if you feed the same level of meal, like the grass quality in organic farms, like if you go onto any organic farms, I think there's a perception out there that it's fields of rushes that these cows are going to be grazing, like, but it's, it's, it's the quality of the grass is often better than what you would see in conventional farms and purely because of the high clover content that's in there you you have a lot higher quality so if anything milk could technically go up because of the, the level of clover that's in in the pastures on organic farms so i would not i would typically wouldn't drop the output per cow so you're dropping me sales based on having less cows not less milk per cow then the milk price um so milk price for the kind of the spring calving systems they've set a base price for next year now the milk company of 40 cents a liter uh which doesn't sound great at the moment comparing to conventional prices uh it's probably like the i think the conventional price most of them around 38 cents at the moment yeah, but, but organic prices don't tend to fluctuate much uh they tend to stay pretty much level like glenisk have had the same price for the last i'd say 10 years like so um you know, the, whereas your your conventional is up and down, and are we at the top of the conventional market? Um, so, like, if you look at the last five years average, like uh, organic prices would have been somewhere in the region of eight to nine cents ahead of conventional prices. Um, so you have to take the ups with the downs when it comes to conventional, and there probably isn't as many downs. Um, Glenisk are often 60 cents for winter milk and, and just show you 40 cents for the, the summer milk, and they're often 50 cents a flat rate then for that um, zero, zero meal um, the yogurt, that milk. Um, so I would pitch, if you're going to spring calving system, I would be pitching my milk price at 40 cents plus solids. So if you're if your existing milk price is five cents ahead of the co-op base price, your 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 uh, organic price is going to be the same. And if you're doing it for a winter mix situation, all the winter mix guys will it's a flat rate price. I would be pitching that somewhere around fifty cents a liter is, uh, when you're putting that into your figures. And then if we look at the cost side, the only two costs that are really going to change is uh, your meal. So depending on what you feed, your meal is going to, to change. If you keep the same amount, it'll double because you're paying double the price. Um, but if you drop, you have to just account for that and you probably have to account for milk output per cow if you're dropping your meal. Fertilizer is going to be, in most cases, it'll be eliminated, but we'd still allow a bit for putting in bits of lime and maybe uh, just to address those low index one fields, uh, a bit of ground rock phosphate, something like that. So two or three grand would, would cover a lot of the fertilizer bill. Um, and then all the other variable costs will drop with in line with cow numbers so they're variable variable by nature so as cow numbers come down those variable costs come down like if you have 80 cows versus uh, 100 cows your vet bill is going to go down in line with that um your fixed costs are going to stay fixed because they're fixed by nature so the land lease is going to stay the same uh, the machinery running the insurance the council but they're all going to stay fixed so if you have 50 000 fixed costs already you're going to have 50 000 fixed costs in a uh, in an uh, organics and then the other key thing is the organic farming payment scheme so at the moment farmers get 220 per hectare for the first two years in conversion that's up to max of 60 hectares so that works out about 13,000 for the mm-hmm. farmer with yeah. 60 hectares <laughs> and they get 170 after that so that works out about 10,000 uh, after that and that makes up an awful lot of the, the gap above the top and it, the, that calculation will vary greatly between farmers if you're a farmer that's already lowly stocked um, and I do that some, I'm going to show that you, you're better off in organics. If you're up around the 170 kilos organic nitrogen per hectare and we have to bring you back a small bit, 
I'm probably going to show that you will make as much money out of organics, but you've less cows to milk. Um, and if you're a derogation farmer and I do it, I'll probably show that you're going to maybe lose, well, you lose marginally in organics, um, but again, you've a lot less cows. Um, so you might be back 10, 20,000 of profit, but you could also be back 50 cows. Um, so it's, it's, it's a case of weighing one up against the other. I suppose just on that, I didn't touch on that. Like the, the, I always kind of put it into three brackets of who does organic suit. Um, so the first is the farmer that's um, already lowly stocked. So stocking rate of one and a half livestock units per hectare. I do the figures. I don't have to change anything with stock numbers. He's not spreading that much fertilizer anyway. Um, so we just put him into the organic system and you can show a huge uh, improvement in profit. The second category farmer is the farmer that when quotas went, uh, he or she expanded from 80 cows up to 120 cows, but they forgot to build the 40 extra cubicles and slurry storage, maybe didn't keep up the pace with cow numbers. Um, and the parlour is maybe a bit small and they're now looking, if I go back to 80 cows, uh, I might have to spend a hundred or two quarter of a million in the yard to bring it up to scratch. Do I go back to 80 cows and would I be better off? And you do the figures on that. And in most cases, yeah, they would go back to 80 cows, go into organics, you, you would probably be better off. And the third category, is, which is where I see probably most of the room for uh, where maybe a lot of the new entrants to organic uh, coming from, is the farmer with the 100 cows on 100 acres, and the next thing, 50 acres comes up outside the ditch to rent. And they're saying, do I go to 150 cows on 150 acres? And do I spend all that money to build the cubicles, the story storage, the parlor that goes with those extra 50 cows? Uh, or do I stay at 100 and look at organics? And that, that I think is where, where a lot of people are going to look at organics is in that situation. Uh, with all that's coming down the track with nitrates and changes, there's a lot of people, I suppose, probably a bit slow in, in, in borrowing to, to for those extra 50 cows and maybe that's where, where our organics might fit in for a lot of people okay so joe i suppose we better wrap it up with that um just i suppose if uh, anyone is interested in talking to you they can just uh, google uh Chagas organics i suppose or what's the best way to get in touch with you yeah i suppose just one thing that and i'm starting there in two weeks time an introduction to organic dairy and course so if anyone is genuinely interested in finding out more uh send me an email to joe.kelleher at chagas.ie that's k-e-l-l-e-h-e-r and uh, I'll add you to the list. There's two online meetings in December just to go through the, the basics of what it's about. And we'll be inviting a few people in from the market side of things to explain where the markets are. And then in January, I have two farm visits organized uh, for people to see what's actually happening. One spring cabin, one autumn cabin, just to see what's, what's actually happening on the ground. So just drop me an email if anyone is interested in uh, joining that. Super, Joe. Thanks very much. So um, just to let people know that next week I'll be talking to Siobhan Kevin in relation to Board BA producer reports um, just to get a bit more insight into them and what they mean for you. Uh, I'll finish up with that. Thanks a million, Joe. Very interesting uh, conversation with you. Wish everybody well for the week um, and stay safe in the meantime. And we we'll try and get out of this damn COVID. It's getting more than frustrating at this stage. We'll see you next week. Uh, and thanks again, Joe. Thanks, Jordan.